I'd like to remind uh, questioners we don't have a lot of time. You offer a problem for property dualism on the basis of an intuition pump, whereby if God fixes all the physical facts, doesn't he thereby automatically fix these other facts in a world where everything created is physical? And I want to offer a different analogy and see what you think about it. So suppose God distributes a bunch of massive bodies. Um, do we then, does he then by, thereby fix all of their powers? And it seems to me, no, because he might do something like this. He might say, ah, let the world be Newtonian. And then he might assign a value to the gravitational constant or something like that. So there's an extra step for God to do before, and then press play, before everything, before you know all the powers of the world and the way things are going to go, which is to fix the laws. Are you so, thinking, so I'll, are you thinking of space time? Uh, oh, so I don't want to say anything about the physics here. I never do. <laughs> uh, so, so there's, there's the analogy. Yeah, but there's here. a question whether space time is one of the objects in the world or not. Or you just, there's nothing, you have these massy objects acting on each other and nothing else. There's no such thing as space time. Suppose there is. There isn't any. Just the, uh, I would say that the value of the gravitational constant is simply supervened on the causal powers of the objects. Uh, so here, here's the, the suggestion in the mental case, is that God, ha he distributes things physically and fixes the physical facts, whatever that amounts to. But then he has to further declare a certain psychophysical law, a law according to which when you have an organism in this state, then it's thinking that P and that state thinking that Q and so forth. And there is, there's nothing immaterial in this world? No, no, every substance is a physical substance except for God and the angels. Uh, well, look. Okay, just for God. If you think, if you think that that's um, possible, then you reject my intuition. But my intuition pump is just a uh, way of bringing this before your, the situ situation before your mind, so you'll see what, yes, if you think that God would have to um, uh, decrease some psychophysical laws in addition to uh, the distribution of matter here, uh, in a world with no thinking immaterial substances, uh, then um, you won't be convinced. The, in the intuition pump is just a matter for focusing our thoughts. Right. Uh, Peter, um, you're right. I have been unable to find in print a definition of non-physical property that seems to me both to be intelligible and likely actually to capture what properly duodists mean by the phrase. Now, your ability to find, not to find things intelligible is much greater than mine. <laughs> uh, uh, but I, I think, and you're quite right, of course, that Chalmers's definition won't give, uh, won't give the property dualist what he wants. Mm -hmm. But I think you should have investigated, had a look, or given us a sample of more traditional definitions of the physical as opposed to the non-physical and so on. So may Physical I see what you've got, what you object to in a, uh, a definition I've been running for many years, uh, that a, a physical property is one to the instantiation of which in a substance, that substance necessarily does not have privileged access by introspection. Uh, and so you can go on to a mental property as one mm. to which that subject necessarily does have, always does have uh, access by uh, introspection, and that will give you the unity which you want in the mental. When you, when you just pointed to sensations and thoughts as instances mm -hmm. of it, one wants to know what binds them together. So, what's wrong with de defining a physical property loosely as a public property? There might be that might be good for some purposes. You saw my definition of mental property, right? A property that entails. Of course, I could have defined uh, a physical property as a non-mental. Uh, my uh, definition didn't actually have that consequence, you may say. I defined a physical property as one to the instantiation of which in a substance, that substance necessarily always has uh, access, and a mental one, sorry, has necessarily always does not have access, and a mental one, that is one to which uh, it always does have access, that allows for the existence of neutral properties which are neither mental nor physical. I mean, but, yeah, I was I was aware being, of this being a, being a uh, a property might uh, be uh, an instance of a. I was aware of your definition. You know, I would have said that uh, I didn't. I thought it was would simply be a variant um, uh, describing um, a physical property uh, as um, a property uh, that can't be that isn't that doesn't imply uh, thinking or sensation. But now it I see that consequence. Yes, it has that. But uh, but is um, 
Yeah, I think there may now be a, have been a quantifier error in that piece of uh, thinking. What is the quantifier error? I, I, I think that uh, um, I said I think that there may be a quantifier error, which means I've got to write it down uh, carefully and look at it. So you may be you may be onto something uh, here. I'll have to think about that. Um, this isn't an objection, just a question about your, your views, Peter. Um, so I'm wondering whether you need emergent powers in order to account for the fact that you, as a whole substance, can perform certain acts that are in your control. I'm wondering if you think you need emergent powers. In my control, do you mean, look, um, a, uh, an automatic door on a dam may be under the control of a computer, right? Is whether the door goes up under the control of the computer? No, I mean a strong sense in which it's both in your power to do and not to do, whether it happens. Yeah, well, now, but now we're, uh, we're speaking of the mystery of free will, <laughs> you know, which uh, I, don't know what to, I don't know what to say uh, about that. That is, I don't even, I don't even know why free will is, uh, con is consistent with indeterminism, which I suppose it to be. You know, but I don't know how to answer some standard arguments against that objection. This is all bound up together. Uh, so, you know, when you're talking about this two-way power, you're talking about free will, and I'm just, um, my genius is rebuked, okay? <laughs> Last question. Um, so you believe in causal explanations, and you said a causal explanation is when you have a sentence like, the lamp fell over, the word because, uh, someone kicked it, something like that. Mm -hmm. Those sentences, I guess, are true and indeed are true causal relations, um, sorry, true causal explanations because of something going on in the world. I mean, if the lamp fell over and the kicking occurred miles away and there was no kind of communication between them, that sentence would be false. Uh, so I guess I, I have a question and then I, and then I have what I think is an objection. Um, I think you want to say that uh, although there's not a causal relation holding between the, say, the foot that did the kicking, there's not cause, you know, the cause relation between the foot that did the kicking and the lamp that fell. Oh, no, there's all kinds of causal relations, like kicking, for example. Yeah, good. Okay, so you do believe in those relations. Good. Yeah, that I explicitly yeah. said there good. are causal all right, good. relations. Okay. All right, well, I want to make sure. You know, earlier on, you, you mentioned in the paper how you like uh, sort of this kind of abundant view of properties where Russell paradoxes aside, let's, uh, you know, so if there's, I guess, the property of being P, there's probably, and being Q, there's probably being P or Q and so on. I wonder why we don't take all those causal relations, disjoin them, and then call that the causation. So I don't, I quite, I'm trying to understand on your view okay, why, well, why you actually, haven't just offered the theory answered. of the causal relation that is it's reducible to. I actually relations. answered that. Yeah. You can do that, but you get a relation that holds between substances. Acts on. Okay, that's fine. So the way, oh, okay, that's fine. So, so I could put your view this way, and maybe, we, maybe there's no objection here. Peter believes in, 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 in the causal relation. He just thinks it's disjunctively analyzed and holds between substances, not events. Well, I mean, it's sort of like talking about whether there could be a God who was wholly evil, uh, right? I would take, I would say no, because I think that uh, moral perfection is part of the concept. Could there be a relation, could it be that the relation of causation doesn't, as philosophers had supposed, hold between events, but rather between substances? Well, I would say it was essential to the first idea that it held between events. Uh, but remember, I'm only, that's the classical picture of causation. Yeah, but then, then you don't need your big, long, fancy paper. You just need, I don't understand what events are. Causation essentially holds between events. Well, I also said. Now we're done. Well, for one thing, that was one section of the paper. Uh, and I said, you know, if um, somebody could both uh, present a good account of the causal relation and a good ontology of events, I would um, rethink my um, belief that there's uh, that there's no such thing as events. Okay. Uh. Let's thank both our speakers. <laughs>